In the name of the Father, the Son, Holy Spirit, Amen. I'd like to welcome you all to our Perseverance Family Conversation. And as always, it's great to be with all of you. And we always like to start our conversation by inviting Mary to be with us. Mary is the mother of God. Mary is the mother of the church. And Mary is the mother of each and every one of us. Also, when we pray the Hail Holy Queen, as we end the rosary, we also invoke Mary. Mary is our, our life, our sweetness, and our hope. Mary is our life, our sweetness, and our hope. So let's turn to Mary and beg Mary to help us to really get to know and love God with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. As we pray, the prayer that Mary loves most, and that is the Hail Mary. Together, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and bless the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for our sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. I would like to invite to be with us our spiritual director. Our spiritual director is the Holy Spirit himself. The Holy Spirit has many different titles. The Holy Spirit is known as the Paraclete. The Holy Spirit is also known as the Gift of Gifts. The Holy Spirit is also known as the sweet guest of our souls. The Holy Spirit is also our consoler. He's also our counselor. Holy Spirit is our interior master. St. Paul reminds us in these words, he says, we really don't know how to pray as we ought. But the Holy Spirit intercedes with ineffable groans. So we can say, Ama Abba. We can say Abba, which means Daddy or Father. Let's turn to the Holy Spirit, the sweet guest of our soul, and ask him to give us a lot of light Light a light in our intellect. As well as the fire of divine love to burn within our hearts. As we humbly implore the Holy Spirit to enlighten us and to be with us during our conversation. So let's pray. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and enkindle within us the fire of your divine love. Send forth your spirit and they shall be created. Thou shalt renew the face of the earth. Let us pray. O God, who did instruct the hearts of your faithful, by the light of the Holy Spirit, grant us that by the same Spirit we may be truly wise and ever rejoice in his consolation through the same Christ our Lord. Amen. 
Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Our Lady of Fatima, pray for us. St. Joseph, pray for us. St. Michael the Archangel, pray for us. St. Gabriel, pray for us. St. Raphael, pray for us. St. Ignatius of Loyola, pray for us. St. Maria Faustina Kowalska, pray for us. All God's angels and saints, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, the Holy Spirit, amen. Now, true, my friends, the family that prays together stays together. So after praying together, I promise that I'll pray for you and your intentions. I'll place you on the altar in my Masses today. I actually have two weddings today, so with Masses, of course, I'll pray for you in the Mass. There's no greater prayer in the whole world than the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. So my friends, I'd like to place you all on the altar and um, my first intention will be that all of us, all of us will be open to the gifts of the Holy Spirit. That we be open to the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And perhaps this will be our prayer. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Come, Holy Spirit, come through the heart of Mary. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Come, Holy Spirit, come through the heart of Mary. My second intention will be, I'd like to pray for all of your families. Especially I'd like to pray for your family members, your children, perhaps your adult children who no longer practice their faith. That they're seeking happiness in the wrong place. that they would return to God this holy season of Lent. My other intention will be, I never get tired of praying with you tying with, praying with you for those who are dying but especially let's pray for those who are dying now who are not well disposed. That they're not perhaps in the state of grace. That they would return to God with all their hearts. And that they would be saved. Jesus says, what does it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his soul? So together let's pray for the dying that they would have recourse to God's infinite mercy. Give thanks to the Lord for his good, for his mercy endures forever.
So I mentioned to you over the past week that we're preparing also to celebrate the feast day solemnity of St. Joseph. That will actually be on Monday. Normally we celebrate the solemnity of St. Joseph March 19th, but that, follow, that falls on a Sunday in Lent, so it's transferred to the following day. To the following day. So, we've talked about Protodulia, that St. Joseph is first in devotion because of the office or vocation that he was given to be the spouse of Mary as well as to be the earthly father of Jesus. We talked then about St. Uh, Joseph as the master of the interior life. That was the title that Teresa of Avila loved most. St. Joseph can help us to grow in our prayer life. We talked about St. Joseph as the patron of workers. Also pray for Carmen that we she'll find, find work in honor of good St. Joseph. Sometimes God allows a door to close to open up two better doors or even a window. Pray that St. Joseph will help us to work physically, mentally, as well as spiritually. We uh, also invoke St. Joseph as the related to the enemy, the devil, St. Joseph is the terror of demons. We're all tempted every day. When there's a formal exorcism, the exorcist will invoke the holy name of Jesus, the name of Mary, and then invoke also the powerful name of St. Joseph. When we mention St. Joseph also as the patron of fathers, we mention the fact that we live in a society with a dropout dad. When fathers are derelict in their duty, they're negligent in their obligation toward their, their children, toward their family, problems surface in society. Gang members, violence, even confusion with respect to one's sexual identity. So I want to ask St. Joseph to help the fathers to assume their responsibility of being the head of the family. Good father should have God as father, Mary as their mother, love their families, love their wife, and be ready to sacrifice for their children. And given that today is Saturday, I'd like to speak about St. Joseph as the husband of Mary. That's actually the feast day on Monday. St. Joseph is the husband of Mary. St. Joseph is the husband of Mary. If we want, if we want, my friends, to draw closer to 
Mary, we do it through St. Joseph. And Mary always points us to Christ and Christ to God the Father. We see here just a, a clear manifestation of humility. So let's cultivate devotion to St. Joseph. All right, let's enter now into our conversation. And I was reading through the first reading, which is taken from the prophet Hosea. And what struck me was, he says, let us know. Let us know. Let us strive to know the Lord. And I'd like to focus on that. Yesterday, the scribe asked Jesus, what is the greatest of all commandments? And the greatest of all commandments is to is to love God, to know God, to love God with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. So I'm going to do today, knowing God, how can we really love God if we don't if we don't know God. So what I'd like to do is I composed in my notebook that I have in front of me, I've composed a list of books that we can eventually read to get to know God better. So I'd like to just briefly go through these books because one way in which we can get to love God is we have to get to know God better. So I like to just go through it's uh, a bibliography of good books that can help us to get to know God better. And the first of these would be the, of course, would be the Bible. Of all the books that we want to get to know is the Bible. For that reason, for that reason, when we're doing our holy hour every day, and hopefully we're trying to be faithful to our holy hour, is the primary source of our meditation should be the Bible, which is the Word of God. Bible, which is the Word of God. Reading, meditating, getting to know, getting to love, Trying to put in practice what we have in the Bible, my friends, is very, very important. And not only would the Bible be the source of our getting to know God, but also when we're talking to people, biblical truths should surface. Biblical truths should surface. in our daily conversation, because the Bible has to be our light. All right, so I'm going to try to go through several books in our conversation today. And the next would be, it's called, I'll type it in for you. This is one After the Bible, this is perhaps one of the most well-known, loved, purchased, and read books in the world. It's called The Imitation of Christ. So The Imitation of Christ the author of The Imitation of Christ, his name is Thomas Kempis. So 
So this was one of Ignatius's favorite books as well as St. Therese. And the author of this is Thomas Kempis. It is really a classic, Thomas Kempis. And it's actually divided into four books. I'll just give you a summary of the last, it's divided into four different sections called books. The last part is dedicated to the Eucharist explains the importance of Mass and Holy Communion and preparation and thanksgiving. And of course, the Mass is the source and summit of our holiness, as Vatican II points out. So that book, The Imitation of Christ, I'm going to try to move at a pretty good pace. I actually have, I've got 10 books altogether. See if I can get through this library. In which hopefully all of us will be able to read some of them during the course of our lives to get to know Christ better and better. Okay, then the third would be, okay, it's called, It, this is a classic. It's called The Rule of St. Benedict. In the past, we, we've talked about St. Benedict as well as his uh, sister, St. Scholastica. St. Benedict was inspired to compose a rule. And the rule that he composed is the model rule for religious life. St. Benedict is proclaimed to be the father of Western monasticism. And St. Anthony of the Desert is known to be the father of Eastern monasticism. And most of the rules, I'm a religious, most of the rules of religious, male as well as female, have some elements of the rule of St. Benedict in their rule. For example, set times for prayer. Time for silence, community life, hospitality, the importance of obedience. And one of the sayings from St. Benedict, which is most known, is ora e labora. That's Latin for work and prayer. So in that rule, there's the harmonious blend of working, but also praying. And also in that book is the importance of the superior, to be a father to the other members of the community. So let's move on. I'm trying to move at a quick pace. So I'm just going to give you a little taste of what I consider to be the classic classic literature, Catholic literature, so we can get to know. Now, I'm taking this from Hosea, it says two times, know the Lord, know the How can we love God if we don't know God? Okay, the next one would be Confessions of St. This is a real classic, Confessions of St. Augustine. 
proclaimed to be the first autobiography. This work of St. Augustine is a real spiritual classic. In time, we should all get to know St. Augustine better. In this book, we see the interplay of three saints. We've got St. Ambrose, we have St. Monica, and through their interworking, we have eventually St. Augustine, the interwork of these three great saints. And often I'll tell mothers who are really trying to get their adult children back to the church, okay, you've invited them to come back. St. Ambrose said to Monica, now the best thing for you to do is don't talk to Augustine about God, but rather talk to God about Augustine. So the Confessions of St. Augustine, as Sophie points out, it's an amazing work. It's an amazing work. St. Augustine was an, indeed a genius, a literary master, a theologian, a first-class theologian, and very original. Now I'm going to write, express to you another classic, which is a different literary style, but another classic. And that would be the following. And that would be the, the Summa Theologica of St. Thomas Aquinas. I'm putting side by side two of the greatest writers in the Catholic Church. So we've got the Confessions of St. Augustine. And I, I've uh, written for you the, the Summa Theologica of St. Thomas Aquinas. According to many, the Summa Theologica of St. Thomas Aquinas was the greatest theological masterpiece ever written. Interesting thing about this is it was actually Thomas Aquinas never really, you never really finished it, but what was written is indeed a masterpiece all the important topics you have in theology St. Thomas Aquinas explains. St. Thomas Aquinas synthesizes the knowledge of theology up, up to the 13th century. And for seminarians who will be future priests, this is the one of the key classics for future priests, and it is the Summa Theologica of St. Thomas Aquinas. I've always liked this it's called the Tour of the the Tour of the Summa by Walter Farrell, I've always liked that very much. It's kind of a, a succinct summary of the Summa. So if you want to get, to get to know God and the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, the Trinity, original sin, creation, prayer, the sacraments, moral theolo theolo theology, 
the reality of heaven and hell. The Summa Theologica of Thomas Aquinas is, is a must. So right now I'm going to put together, <clears throat> well, I'm, I'll do this first. I would say this is very important for us. It's uh, the collected works of St. Teresa of Collected works of Saint Teresa of Avila. The collected works of Saint Teresa of Avila. I like the Kavanaugh translation. We all have our favorite translations. I mention this because. St. Teresa of Avila is one of the, she's the first woman doctor of the church. And if we are interested in pursuing a life of prayer, and all of us are, St. Teresa of Avila is, St. Teresa of Avila is the doctor of prayer. She's the doctor of prayer. Now, some of you might be asking, well, well, what are the works of Teresa of Avila? So what I'm trying to do today is just give you the title and just a very quick summary of the content. But the key is to be exposed to these works and, and, to, and to read some of them. You're not going to be able to read them overnight. This will be perhaps a lifelong task. Her classic are called, first would be what's called La Vida. La Vida, which means the life, the life of Teresa of Avila, where she just goes to her life and her struggle to grow in her prayer life. Didn't come easy. Then you have another work. In Spanish it's called Camino de Perfección, or in English the way of perfection. And the way of perfection, my friends, is simply a commentary on the Our Father. Then, we also have what is called the Interior Castle. Spanish translated Las Moradas. Interior Castle. Now, what the interior castle is, St. Teresa of Avila gives us a, an analogy of the spiritual life. The growing of the spiritual life is like a castle that has different rooms, which will explain the different forms of prayer, vocal prayer, meditation, contemplation, prayer of simplicity, then you're arriving at are the, the, myst, the higher mystical realms of prayer. And Teresa of Avila has also written the foundations where she founded all these different convents in, in Spain. Spanish fundaciones. So that would be the next. St. Teresa of Avila, her collected works.
Related to this would be also her spiritual director, and that would be the works of St. John of the Cross. You have the works of St. Teresa of Avila, then you have the works of St. John of the Cross, and St. John of the Cross was actually, he was the spiritual director of Teresa of Avila. So they worked together. The three classics of John of the Cross would be Spiritual Canticle, which this great saint explains the book from the Old Testament, the Song of Songs. Then he explains our spiritual life is like climbing a mountain. Our spiritual life is like climbing a high mountain. For that reason, his work is called the Ascent to Mount Carmel. And then, perhaps his most famous work, that of John the Cross, would be the dark night of the soul. Of all of his works, it's probably the one that most people remember, the dark night of the soul. In this spiritual masterpiece, John of the Cross, known as the mystical doctor, he explains the spiritual life in three stages, dividing the spiritual life into three, three different stages. And it's called the Via Purgativa, the Purgative Way, Via Illuminativa, the Illuminative Way, then the Via Unitiva, which would be the Unitive Way. Via Purgativa, Purgative Way, Illuminativa, the Illuminative Way, and Via Unitiva would be the Unitive Way. That's St. John of the Cross. Now, now, I'd like to mention now what I consider to be one of the most important works in the history of the church. And this would be called the Catechism of, of the Council of Trent. Catechism of the Council of Trent, I would consider to be one of the most important works in the Catholic Church. And the reason being, in the 1500s, we have 
we have what is called the Protestant Reformation, which thousands, even millions, are exiting the church, enter into another church called the Protestant Church in England with Henry VIII, in Germany with Martin Luther, in Switzerland with John Calvin. So many were leaving the Catholic Church. And many were leaving the Catholic Church simply because of the ignorance that they didn't know, they didn't know what the Catholic Church taught. So there was a council that was convened in the southern part of Italy, in the city of Trentino, Trent. And after many meetings, which seemed as if they would never finish because there were some quarrels and disagreements, and Charles Borromeo was able to bring the, the Council Fathers back together more than once, Finally, the most important document that was promulgated from the Council of Trent would be the Catechism of the Council of Trent. This is called the Counter-Reform. So what you have is the Protestant Reformation then you have the Catholic counter-reform. That's right, you've got the, 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 Protest, the Protestant Reformation, and the Church intervenes with, with what is called the counter-reform. Which I feel that all of you eventually should try to purchase the Catechism of the Council of Trent. From there, making a connection between that and the modern world, you have, my friends, of great importance is what is called the Catechism of the Catholic Church. And this would be John Paul II. So you see, side by side, you've got the Catechism of the Council of Trent, and you've got the Catechism of the Catholic Church. You have about 400 years separation from both. But it'd be a very interesting study, juxtaposition, reading the Catechism of the Catholic Church, and then reading the Catechism of the Catholic Church. This is Paul composed in the Pontificate of, of the great Pope John Paul II. So in the 2,000 years of Catholicism, The 2,000 years of Catholicism, there have only been two universal catechisms. There would be the Catechism of the Council of Trent in the 1500s, then the Catechism of the Catholic Church by John Paul II in the 1990s. From the universal catechisms, are written what are called local catechisms. For example, in the United States, the Baltimore Catechism, which is really a spiritual masterpiece, the Baltimore Catechism, which I was brought up and raised that we were being taught the Baltimore Catechism for many years, I'd say from when I was a little child to my, when my parents were children.
but that would be a local catechism. Another local catechism I've been using for the adults is the Catechism of Adults by Father Kogan. Came out around the year 2000. That would be a local American catechism. So what I'm doing, my friends, is I'm I'm just taking from the book of the prophet Hosea who says, let us know, let us know, let us strive to know the Lord. So I'm taking that as a starting point. Let us get to know, get to know the Lord. How can we, how can we love God how can we love God and how can we obey his commandments if we don't even know who he is? So I'm giving you a series of literary sources so that we can get to know God better and better each day. And from this knowledge of God to love God. Now the last literary classic would be so I'm giving you 10 different sources today would be the all right there you have it it's the Vatican II documents In my study here, I was able to pull out from my library what I believe to be the best translation, and it would be this. It says, the Vatican Collection, Vatican Council II, the conciliar and post-conciliar documents. I believe, if you look below, Austin Flannery O.P., Austin Flannery O.P. means he's a Dominican. This is um, this has been my favorite translation, and this also I like it because it's in it's in big print. We are getting older. None of us are getting younger, but it's in it's in big print. So I I like this very much because it's in it's in big print. So this is the version that I I like best. Vatican Collection, Vatican II Documents, Conciliar, as well as Post-Conciliar Documents, translation by Austin Flannery. Now, the Vatican II Documents, there are 16 basic documents. But all the documents in Vatican II I'm just going to introduce you today into the four, these are called the four dogmatic constitutions. The four dogmatic constitutions, at least we should be familiar with what they are and eventually to read them. So the four dogmatic constitution would be De Verbum. Okay, there you have it. The first would be De Verbum, which means the Word of God in Latin. That explains the importance of the Bible as well as divine revelation. So, De Verbum. Second would be Sacrosanctum Concilium. That would be on the Mass as well as the liturgy. Okay, so the second would be Sacro Sanctum Concilium, which is the dogmatic constitution on the Mass and the liturgy. 
Then the third would be what is called gaudium spes. Gaudium spes means joy and hope. This would be the document on the church in the modern world, which who was behind this was Carol Wojtyla. We also know him as Pope John Paul II. He was instrumental in the composition of Gaudium Spes. This addresses the problem of atheism, the problem of the family, And the last and perhaps the most famous of all the documents of Vatican II, these are documents in Latin. These are all originally in Latin. It's called Lumen Lumen Gentium. Now, Lumen Gentium presents the hierarchical structure of the church the hierarchical structure of the church where you have the, the priests, then you have the bishops, you have the laity. And the fifth chapter has always been one of my favorite chapters. Chapter 5 from Vatican II <coughs> is a chapter on the universal call to holiness. The universal call to holiness, which means all of us, all of us, my friends, are called to become saints. All of us. The universal call to holiness, we're all called to become saints. As Jesus says, be holy as your heavenly Father is holy. So my friends, taken from Hosea, let us know. Let us strive to let us strive to know the Lord. How can we love God if we don't know who God is? Ignorance of God can be fatal. So I've given you in a certain sense a mini class on Catholic literature today. I hope that this, that this has been helpful to all of you. Giving you a mini university lecture on 10 of the spiritual literary classics in the Catholic Church. And a brief review. Review. We're going to get to know our faith by getting to know the Bible, which is the Word of God. That's the first. The second is the imitation of Christ by Thomas Kempis. Third would be the rule of St. Benedict. The fourth would be the Confessions of St. Augustine. The fifth would be the Summa Theologica of St. Thomas Aquinas, the Angelic Doctor. The fifth would be the Catechism of the Catholic Church. The Catechism of the Council of Trent. Then we mentioned the works of St. Teresa of Avila, the Doctor of Prayer. Then the documents, rather the teachings of St. John of the Cross, 
especially the dark night of the soul. Then we have the Catechism of the Catholic Church of John Paul II, as well as the documents from the Second Vatican Council, among which would be the four dogmatic constitutions, De Verbum, Sacrosanctum Concilium, God in Respes, and Lumen Gentium. So my friends, I've given you a, a short literary spiritual course on 10 of the most important works we have in our Catholic Church, in our tradition. I invite you to maybe go through these and try to memorize them. And you might even share this conversation with some of your friends that are maybe looking into Catholicism or Catholics that don't really know their faith. So I've given you a good literary summary in our conversation today. And God bless you. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.